to give information to the uh, uh, staff in order to help them uh, with identify, identify uh, who they're looking for. All the counselors and other uh, professional people here in that role will meet where? like the Cooper family. Whenever I found out, we first went to Children's and we just been hopping around the city trying to find out if uh, John Doe baby is ours and we've come up negative every time. Every day, I'm gonna drop him off and I go see him every day at lunch and today I didn't get to go. <laughs> Little Antonio didn't make it. Neither did Bailey Allman, the baby in the now world famous picture. Well, her birthday was one day before the explosion. She was one. This is her picture. <laughs> she was so happy. She always smiled all the time. She was the sweetest little girl. She loved everyone. <laughs> she was so sweet. Which was a way that it could be a little bit more comforting. A thousand thoughts must be racing through her mind. Erin Allman's one-year-old baby is dead and she's about to meet the two men who risked their lives trying to save her little girl. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for getting her out of there. <laughs> the first to arrive, Oklahoma City Police Sergeant John Avery. <laughs> Thank you so much for getting her out of <laughs> there. No. Please <laughs> just out of there. Sergeant Avery raced into the federal building after the explosion and pulled little Bailey out of the rubble. <laughs> she didn't suffer then, huh? Do what? She didn't suffer then no, at no, all. That's, in fact, when, I, we, when we dug her out, she, was, I, she wasn't a baby crying. It was a baby next to her crying. Yeah. That baby's all right. She's not all right. Sergeant Avery continued searching for more children and handed Bailey to Oklahoma City firefighter, Captain Chris Fields. How are you, Beth? Good to see you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so sorry to let him in. Thank you for getting her out of there as fast as you could. He got out of the game, man. There was just, there was nothing we could do. I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna miss her. <laughs> Here's the man right here that's got her out though, buddy. Oh, you good to meet you, buddy. Thank you. Really. A rare moment when two rescuers are reconnected. The kind words and tears, some their own tears, are reminders of why they do what they do. It's their time to be human. When I was holding her, I, I, you know, I think of my son, I see my son, and when I get home, see my son, I, I see her daughter, so. I went home last night and hugged my kids for hours. And we went out late and then went home and hugged them again. And uh, in fact, I just talked to them all the way down here and, and they just said, Daddy, please hurry and get home. Daddy, please come on home. Uh, that's all they can think about right now, give me home. Do you feel better now that you've met them? Yeah. What's it like? At least I know, you know, and they're really nice people. And that one, the fireman has a two-year-old little boy, so. I feel a lot better knowing that they were that nice to help her. Uh, we have not recovered any more children. We still have the number at 13, uh, and all 13 of those children have been identified. To me, every knock on the door and every telephone call is somebody else who, who cares, and every, uh, every flower in this house, every plant in this house, you know, to me, it's just a, a symbol of, of love, and it just shows how much the people care because they're coming from everywhere. And to me, that, that's one of the things that's keeping me going. And that's not easy when you consider her loss. Edie Smith's only two children were killed in the explosion, two-year-old Colton and three-year-old Chase. I woke up this morning and I thought uh, that today was going to be a good day, you know. Today was going to be a good day, and... Uh, 
I didn't think I had any tears left in me, and I've already, I've cried several times already today. It's just a heartbreaking thing. Because someone could do that to children. The cries of their son Christopher are far better than the silence facing parents who lost children in the bombing. And Christopher is now got severe burns on the face and everywhere. But it's still the luckiest baby in the entire daycare center. Can you open your eyes and look at mommy? Christopher is one of six children in the Federal Building Daycare Center who survived the blast. Uh, Christopher uh, injuries like bruises in the brain, heart, lung, uh, ear tumor, I mean ear drums, got holes in it, which is expecting is not going to happen. But those things will be healed if the time allowed. So we're just waiting for time. Time that passed ever so slowly for families still waiting. Every second is just, I just think about my, uh, just think about my poor wife. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to uh, end this and uh, again just made her to put it to rest because uh, she's just so beautiful. Beautiful and a believer. She played Mary, mother of Jesus, in the Easter play at Oklahoma City's Knob Hill Baptist Church. But most of all, she was a good mother to five-year-old Kylie and eight-year-old Erica. Well, hopefully they'll find her soon. Because this waiting for me is just agony. Just not... Uh, uh, I know she's gone, but it, um, I would just like to put her to rest. So for now, waiting families turn their attention to lights of love, the sign of hope from strangers. The other day there was just everyone had their lights on and it really helped me a little bit knowing that people do care. And uh, I've seen the flags have mass at, uh, Shows respect for everyone, uh, you know, affected by this tragedy. People like Peggy Holland. In the Easter play, a crucified Jesus rested in her arms. Now, it's Peggy's turn to rest in the arms of her Savior. Eventually, Peggy Holland's body was among the 167 others recovered before the building was brought down. We have come here in shared sorrow to grieve the loss of beloved neighbors, to honor brave comrades, to join our souls in close communion with God. On eagle's wings, you on the breath of dawn. If anybody thinks that Americans are mostly mean and selfish, they ought to come to Oklahoma. And so the hurting hearts left behind find strength in their faith and in each other as they somehow go on after such great loss. Remember the trust of the children. Darkness will not have its day. Take hold of my hands and we'll both understand that the children will show you the way. The smoke hadn't even settled yet, you know, and I was just going, good Lord, you know, this is just complete. This is complete death, you know. These people didn't deserve this, you know. I've never seen the likes of the poor little kids. That, you know, They're I, all buried under there still. Oh, we, we can't get to the kids. I, I, I moved, I, Joey Fansler was supposed to roof a house on April 19th. Instead, he walked straight into the halls of hell. You know, that was the devil's hand. 
you know, casting a dagger of death into the heart of the United States of America. They reached out their hands and opened their hearts. They seemed to come from everywhere, but nowhere in particular. We call them heroes now, these hundreds and hundreds of Oklahomans, in suits and in uniforms. Just ordinary people, really, until 902 April 19th. In the minutes and the hours and the days after, they were extraordinary. I found three or four of the little guys, you know, bless her little hearts, you know, and we just, you know, but they never knew a thing though, you know, it was all over so fast, it, you know, they never, they never felt a hint of pain that, you know, and, it was just like a candle. It's burning and then it's gone. They, they were with God after that, you know. We kept taking the babies out and just putting them in their, their own playground. We had to lay them in their own playground and they couldn't play anymore. I really wanted to find somebody alive. I really wanted to be able to help somebody continue to live their life by getting them out. And so they accept the title hero with reluctance. Uh, I think a hero is somebody that does something that nobody else would do. And I saw lots of policemen in there. I saw lots of firemen going in there. I saw lots of civilians going in that building. Uh, something that everybody does doesn't make you a hero. It's something that nobody else will do. And on that Wednesday morning, everyone did something. But there were scant few lives left to save. Many rescuers would dig through the rubble and find only frustration. The lucky ones saved a tiny life. Just went and tried to see if I could be of assistance in some kind of a way. You know who you're holding right now? No. News Line 9's Kelly Ogle tells us another hero's story. Got out of the car and, and started uh, heading towards the, the uh, federal building. Uh, we, we began running into individuals that were, uh, were injured. Gruesome murder scenes, terrible traffic accidents, Detective Don Hull had seen everything, or so he thought, before April 19th. The horror unfolding in the bombed out federal building overwhelmed even the most experienced officers. I remember looking up to the third floor and there was the, uh, a gentleman uh, seated that was calling out for help that had lost both of his legs. Detective Hall knew there was a daycare center in the building and about to where it should have been. He and several others climbed over a mountain of rubble determined to find the bombing's youngest victims. Or I could hear um, whimpering and crying and moaning. Uh, and you just kept moving towards the sounds. Hull found five children who were already dead. And then, under three feet of concrete, steel, and trash, he uncovered a tiny foot. The last child that, that uh, I located uh, was, uh, was Joseph Weber. But the boy wasn't breathing, and his arm was twisted behind him in a sickening position. I gently uh, took his left arm and, and started to move it around to the front of his body. And as I did, he kind of gasped and jerked and started to cry. We will get a car to take him to a hospital. We need to. Hall clutched the little boy's body to his, using his chest to apply pressure to a huge cut on the child's face. He headed toward the ambulances. As I approached this area, I, I heard a woman's voice screaming that that, that was my baby. Um, that in and of itself terrified me, that this mother is about to encounter her child in this condition, and I, I, I honestly didn't think he was going to make it. Several times, little Joseph stopped breathing, and Detective Hall got him going again until finally the medics took over. 
Paul left Joseph in an ambulance and returned to search the bombed out building for more victims. I was told later that he didn't make it, which just totally crushed me. For the evening, I thought I could have ran faster. I could have this, I could have that. But I was watching the news like everybody else and I, I saw Dan and I, and I recognized him and I went, wait a minute. You know, this is the father of, of the little boy that we, you know, we got out and got started. And so I immediately called the hospital and I said, you know, please tell me that this is the little boy and that he's okay. And, uh, and he was. This is a full grown Simba, which means he has to become full grown. Two days later, the hero, armed with a stuffed animal, visited Joseph's parents at Children's Hospital. I'm so, so glad sweet. that he's okay. I'm so glad that you were there, because he wouldn't be if you hadn't been there. They are uncomfortable being called heroes, these men in blue. They say it was their training that took over. It's our job, they told us. But it was more than that. It was compassion and courage and gallantry. It was Oklahoma City's finest in their finest hour. Heroes. Some saved lives. Hundreds tried to. Thousands did whatever they could. They gave their blood and their sweat. And of course, they gave their tears. They brought flowers and they planted trees and they tied ribbons of hope around our state and wrapped bandages around the wounded. Newsline 9's Robin Marsh tells us about one of the angels of mercy. It was bad. My, my first feeling was I don't know what happened but it's really bad and a lot of people are hurt. Controlled chaos at St. Anthony Hospital shortly after the bomb blast in downtown Oklahoma City. In the middle of it all, nurse Elizabeth Collier. The biggest pressure to ever face this 15 year veteran find the space in the hospital to care for the hundreds of injured patients heading her way. At any one point in time, we had between three and 500 people in our emergency room drive. So being able to um, triage patients, family members, and volunteers from community-wide to the correct areas became very important so that we could free up the, the driveway to take care of the patients. Also had um, multiple staff members, um, physicians and nurses, and, and the hall was filled with supplies so that we could. A month later, life in the, in the ER hospital. and for Nurse Collier is a bit more normal. But there are things about April 19th that will haunt her for a lifetime. It's wherever I went, whether it was to the outpatient clinic here in the emergency room or in our intensive care unit, I remember the crunch of the glass under my feet. A talented nurse who triumphed under pressure. A rescuer who defines a true hero. And I don't think there were one or two heroes that day. I, I think there were thousands. And I'm honored to be included in that group. From that day through the many to follow, Oklahoma's heroes did what came naturally, their very best. I was standing in front of the building and I was just in total awe as the amount of destruction that had occurred. And at that point, I still didn't know what had happened. I didn't know that it had, was a, a truck bomb or car bomb. All I knew is that there were a lot of people hurt and there was a great amount of destruction that had occurred. They were desperate to hear a sound of life somewhere in the vast silence of death. I was down in the basement and I had asked everyone to uh, be quiet uh, in hopes that when I yelled I would get a response from somebody and I did and there happened to be a lady that was trapped under there and I'm not really exactly sure how long it took us to get her out but we were down there for quite some time and 
once we started getting the debris moved, uh, it was pretty evident there was about 18 inches of water that she was laying in and I had to remove my helmet and crawl under some of the debris to get underneath there with her and I uh, asked her what her name was, I told her who I was and I held her hand and told her that we were going to get her out. At that time it was it was a lot of hope. I mean you know the the hope of finding somebody and uh, that early on you know everybody was really high spirited and I mean just working just hard and fast as you could go. And once we got her out I turned around and the rest of the rescue workers that were down there had cleared a path from where we were all the way to the door on the east side of the building. And it was just like walking in a supermarket, walking through an aisle. That's how good of a job they had done for us. While Bobby Lax and his crew were working to free the woman in the basement, Mike Shannon and his men were in a place they nicknamed the cave. They had to work single file coming through the crack into here. They would move a rock and they would pass the rock back and forth and they would find the people. Back in here is where they were all compiled. And it was about eight people in this one spot. I mean, literally touching each other. So the men had to work through each, one, each victim as they worked their way to the one behind them, to the one behind them, and so forth. It was dangerous work in a tiny space in the dark, death all around. Teams after one after another would crawl back in here and work like this for hours at a time. And they'd pass out body parts. They'd pull the victims past them and pass them out. I'm not gonna lie to you, I, yeah, I was scared. Uh, probably my biggest fear was having a secondary collapse and, and myself being buried. Through the horror, their hope remained. Surely, somewhere, someone was still alive. Yeah, we was looking for voids uh, that there might possibly be survivors in. Uh, the concrete was, was just so compacted, it, it seemed like an endless chore. And uh, we, were, we were able to find a few voids, but uh, unfortunately, there weren't any survivors in them. And after the first night, there would be no more. But the rescuers continued to cling to the hope as the hours and the days and the weeks dragged on. It takes quite a bit to become a hero, you know, and I just don't think I've, I've done enough to be called a hero or considered a hero. After more than two weeks, all that could be done had been. On May 5th, the search for victims stopped. Hope had finally vanished, but the heroes of the heartland came back for one last look and a final farewell. They had all been here before. When times were frantic and the search desperate. They came back this last time in silence lost in a thousand thoughts. The most beautiful memorial left by anyone is not in the rubble of this building, but in the hearts and the lives that knew them and loved them. We come today to remember their lives, and we come today to offer thanks. Thanks for the hundreds and hundreds of people who were involved in the rescue and recovery efforts. As the anguished sound of a lone trumpet filled the still air, red roses sailed into what's become a symbol of horror and honor. From everywhere they watched, from up high and down low. Because even here, on this spot, where a madman's nightmare came true, a little boy can still look up to heroes.